67 presents The Conquering Lion of Judah, a profile study of His Imperial Majesty Haile Selassie I, Emperor of Ethiopia. <laughs> I'm Bill McNeil. Earlier this year, I had the great pleasure of meeting personally the Lion of Judah when he visited Canada at Expo 67. I rode with him aboard the Royal Train from Winnipeg to North Bay, sat with him in his private car, talked with him about himself and his country, and felt the thrill of meeting face-to-face an unforgettable figure from the pages of history. This is a story about a man and his country, Selassie of Ethiopia. If you look at the map of Africa, you will find Ethiopia, the country of spectacular mountains and thirsty deserts, covering most of Africa's eastern horns. It is bounded by the Red Sea to the northeast, the Sudan Republic on the north and west, Somalia on the east, and Kenya on the south. It covers an area of about 457,000 square miles, with a population of 22 million, about the same as Canada. Mr. Robert Thompson, former leader of the Social Credit Party in Canada, lived in Ethiopia for 15 years and knows the country inside out. I asked him, Mr. Thompson, what is Ethiopia like? Well, Ethiopia has been called the Switzerland of Africa. Basically, it is a, a very large country, comparatively speaking, much bigger than France, as big as British Columbia and Alberta together, bigger than the province of Ontario, with more people than we have in Canada, approximately 22 million. Because it is a mountain country, the climate is moderate. Because it is in the monsoon area, there is a lot of rain, particularly in the high areas. It is an agricultural economy. Uh, it is certainly one of the most pleasant countries in Africa, and the Ethiopian people are one of the most pleasant and hospitable people. Ethiopia is one of the few African countries whose ancient and medieval history is known. From remote times, the so-called Horn of Africa has been inhabited by Hamitic and Sudanese peoples who have for centuries been subject to an influx of Semitic elements from southwestern Arabia. It was from a mixture of this kind that the population originated, that at the beginning of the Christian era established the state of Aksum, ruled by Ethiopian kings, though linked to Arabian kingdoms. From the 2nd century BC, the kingdom of Aksum gradually loosened these ties and became autonomous, and the Ethiopian kings took the title Negus Negusti, or King of Kings. Ethiopians proudly claim two or three thousand years of independence. This independence suffered a five-year break under Italian rule between 1935 and 1941. Ethiopia was hardly heard of outside her frontiers until 1935 when Mussolini invaded. Towards the end of 1935, Italian aircraft hurled upon the Ethiopian armies bombs of tear gas. Their effects were slight. The soldiers learned to scatter. The Italian aircraft then resorted to mustard gas. Special sprayers were installed on aircraft so that they could vaporize over vast areas of territory a fine, death-dealing rain. Women, children, cattle, rivers, lakes, and pastures were drenched continually with this deadly rain. Thirty-one years ago this week, every newspaper in the world carried stories about the spunky little Ethiopian monarch, Haile Selassie I, the conquering lion of the tribe of Judah, elect of God, king of kings, Emperor of Ethiopia, who is just over five feet tall and weighs a hundred pounds, who refused to admit defeat to the Italians, who, with his half-naked, poorly armed warriors, made a last-ditch stand at Addis Ababa against the Nito Mussolini force. But finally, the Emperor had to flee the country with his family. On the 30th of June, 1936, he appealed to the League of Nations in Geneva. During Haile Selassie's recent visit to Canada last April, Bill McNeil interviewed him on his train trip between Winnipeg and North Bay, and first of all asked him.
him about that unforgettable day. Your Imperial Majesty, I'd like you to talk about your appearance before the League of Nations when you pleaded for your country in 1936. Yes, the Ethiopian people, as well as myself, fought as much as we could on the ground, the fascist aggressors. But as it is well known, the fascists were well armed. They had the latest weapons. They had air power. Ethiopia had possessed none. After losing the battle in the front, we thought we should start another battle, a political battle at the League of Nations. You have heard of the speech I have made and of the appeal I have made to the League of Nations in 1936. Ladies and gentlemen, the second day around this. Italian fascist newspaper men interrupt the Lion of Judah. They whistle, boo, and shout. Other delegates and spectators applaud the emperor. The league system of collective security is collapsing. An omen of the anarchy about to engulf Europe. After two minutes, order is restored and Haile Selassie speaks in his native tongue, Amharic. <laughs> There is no president for a head of state speaking in the assembly. But there is also no precedent for a people being victim of such injustice and being threatened by abandonment to its aggressor. The precedent was established then and there. England and France abandoned Ethiopia to Mussolini. Your Imperial Majesty, what were your own personal feelings at that time? My personal feeling is my hope I continue to struggle to have our freedom from the fascists. Did you ever give up hope, Your Imperial Majesty? Never in any time. I continue with big hope because I have a relation with my patriot people. I continue to encourage them. They continue their struggle. Italy was not supported. On the contrary, the assembly decided that the economic sanctions voted earlier against Italy should be ended. Thus, the Ethiopian Empire was annexed and was joined with Eritrea and Italian Somaliland to form Italian East Africa. And the emperor sought refuge in England as plain Mr. Tafari Makonan. His imperial crown was kept locked up in a London safe. You kept working while you were in Britain. You were in exile in Britain. For how many years? Four years in half. And you knew all during that period that someday your day would would come. If I haven't this hope, I can't resist to live with this hope. I hope very strong hope. I live four years in half in England. In England, he received sympathy. The offer of a role in a movie and an invitation to appear at the Texas Centennial Exhibition, but little financial support for a proposed $10 million war chest. He didn't give up hope of what he called the ultimate triumph of international justice, and he continued to appeal for it. In 1940, Italy declared war on the Western Allies in World War II. Haile Selassie was then flown to Khartoum in the Sudan to start rallying some of his 10 million former subjects into taking arms with British troops. And when the British forces defeated the Italians and occupied Addis Ababa, the Lion of Judah joyfully went back to his throne on the 5th of May, 1941, and resumed his reign.
What is your country like today? Do you have many problems in Ethiopia? It's a family problem. And the girl problem. Is it true? Yes, the problem we have in Ethiopia is essentially the same as in all other developing countries. The problem that we face is how to quickly raise the standard of living of our people, how to strengthen our democratic constitution in practice. But there is no problem as opposition to the state or opposition to me. Since his restoration in 1941, the Lion of Judah has carried out a program of modernization and of political and social reform, and has begun to westernize the 2,000-year-old Coptic Christian Ethiopia. He created a strong, centralized monarchy. The country, with its 22 million people, revolves around his personal rule. You are descended, Your Imperial Majesty, from King Solomon and the Queen of Sheba. This is just our story, ancient story. The Queen of Sheba, she go to visit Solomon, King Solomon. She met one friend. She returned back to her country. Our story says since that time, we send from King Solomon country. Ali Selassie comes from a line that traditionally sprang from the admiring visit of Makeda, the Queen of Sheba, to King Solomon. She, an Arabian queen, went to Jerusalem to test the wisdom of Solomon, who was said to be the wisest of the kings of Israel, about 950 years before Christ. In the scriptures, the book of Second Chronicles tells that King Solomon gave to the Queen of Sheba all her desire. The traditional story holds that Menelik, son of their romance, went to the state of Aksum, which is Sheba, or Shoah, as it is called today, and which is the main province of Ethiopia, and became the first Ethiopian emperor. This, for the Ethiopian Amharic Christians, who came originally from Arabia, is the beginning of their royal line. From Minalik, most late rulers of Ethiopia, including Haile Selassie, have claimed descent. You are the 334th in the line of succession. Yes, exactly. And the 134th of the Christian kings. Christianity came to Ethiopia, I believe, in 330 A.D. Uh, if you read the Bible, you can get this. Uh, what time the Christianity comes in Ethiopia? The, the book of Acts of the Apostles in the New the Testament Bible. mentions the story of the first convert to Christianity. That was the Ethiopian eunuch who was the courtier of Candice, Queen of Ethiopia. He had been up to worship at Jerusalem, and on his way home, driving along in his chariot and reading the prophet Isaiah, met the apostle Philip, who preached to him about Christ, the Son of God. And when the eunuch believed, Philip baptized him in the water, and the eunuch went on his way home rejoicing. This, according to the Bible, is the first Ethiopian to be converted to Christianity. The story is found in the book of Acts, chapter 8, verses 26 to 39. Ethiopia has been a Christian country since the 4th century. In the year 341 A.D., a certain Frumentius, on a journey from Tyre with his brother, was captured at an Ethiopian port and sent to King Izana at Aksum. The two young men won the confidence of the king and began to evangelize the country. Later, Frumentius went to Alexandria, where he was consecrated by Athanasius the Great, Patriarch of Alexandria and writer of the Creed, to be the first bishop of Ethiopia. Since then, Ethiopia remained a province of the Coptic Church of Alexandria, which always consecrated an Egyptian monk as Archbishop, or Abuna, of this independent church, and sent him away to Ethiopia. Since 1959, and after a struggle for self-independence, the Archbishopric of Ethiopia was raised to a patriarchate by His Holiness Pope Kirillus, of Alexandria and Patriarch of the See of St. Mark, who retains a primacy of honor in Ethiopia. The Coptic Church, and consequently the Ethiopian Church, belongs to the monophysite group of churches which teach that Christ had one nature, that his humanity and divinity became one without intermixing, and that his divinity never separated from his humanity. There are thousands of churches in Ethiopia, usually round, made of mud bricks, and thatched with straw. They 
They contain three concentric circles, and in the center, behind doors, is the sanctuary with a square altar on which stands the Ark of the Covenant. The church now celebrates the liturgy in a dead version of Amharic, which is called Jais. was born on July 24, 1891, and was named Ras Safari Makonnen. His father was a viceroy to the throne and had his son privately tutored in French at the age of six. At 18, shortly after his father died, he became governor of the province. In 1928, he led the troops that killed Empress Zoditu's husband, who was not of royal blood, and became regent. He became emperor on November 2, 1930, and was crowned Haile Selassie I, King of Kings, King of Zion, conquering lion of the seed of Judah, power of the Trinity. Your Imperial Majesty, you were 39 years old when you were crowned in 1930. Yes. Could you talk a bit about the day of the coronation? I never do finish that bad, but I'm just the missing to Chimagerman. Yes. My coronation day was very memorable to me. Not only we had Ethiopian participants in the event, but also a lot of foreign emissaries partook in the celebration of the coronation day. The coronation itself was a Coptic service, Your Imperial Majesty. They are the Coptic, but also the Ethiopian bishop. They are with the Coptic churchmen. was a memorable day in the history of Ethiopia. Since the early hours of that morning, all in Addis Ababa began to prepare for the impressive event of the morning. The emperor and empress Manon had already spent the hours since the night before in prayer and meditation with the priests at the most holy altar within St. George's Cathedral, the largest church in the capital. Through the early morning, the chanting of priests continued. chanting praise songs for the new emperor in Amharic. The son of Ras Makonnen, Haile Selassie, will feed us. His justice is like that of an angel. May God give long life to Haile Selassie, the child of our country. ceremonies of the coronation were performed in a large auditorium adjacent to the west side of the cathedral, which had been especially constructed for the occasion. Shortly after 7.30 a.m., His Imperial Majesty, attired in white silk communion robes, entered the ceremonial hall from the church with an escort of aides and the clergy chanting in the old Coptic language a processional hymn. The spiritual vestment is worn by the Archangel Michael. The precious chasuble is worn by Michael.
throne of Solomon and the Queen of Sheba, a dynasty perpetuated without interruption from that time to King Sehali Selassie and to our time. The emperor was then vested with the seven ornaments of the coronation, including his gold sword studded with precious stones, a diamond encrusted ring, two traditional lances, the imperial scepter, and a golden globe of the earth, the imperial vestments, and at last came the magnificent crown. Seven differently scented ointments of ancient prescription were received on the imperial head, brow, and shoulders, one with each of these ornaments. The final ceremony was a grand tour of the cathedral by the emperor and empress, who was also crowned, but with less elaborate rites. They were escorted by the priests and bishops, princes and high dignitaries, Ethiopian bishops and priests from all over Ethiopia, and a large number of Coptic deacons, carrying palm branches and chanting in mighty volume. Hosanna, blessed be the King of Israel. Blessed is he who cometh in the name of the Lord. Before the questioning of the Abuna, the emperor gave his sacred pledge to uphold the orthodox religion of the Coptic Church of Alexandria, to support and administer the laws of the country for the betterment of the people, and to maintain the integrity of Ethiopia. The emperor is uh, just slightly over five feet tall, but I don't think there is any more noble, bearing person in the world. I agree with you, and when you consider that he is 74 years of age, he's gone through the tremendous trials that he has in matters of state, but also in matters of his own family. Very few people realize the tragedy that has been in his own family when four of his six children have died, and all of them under uh, what must have been very difficult circumstances. His second son, who was so very close to him, was killed in a motor accident. Uh, another son died of a very serious disease. Uh, one of his uh, daughters, whom he had so much uh, respect and love for, as I had seen it, died in childbirth. Uh, surely it has been uh, a difficult life he has had, and yet he is one of the most uh, gracious, one of the most humane, and certainly one of the most distinguished men I have ever known. Ethiopian policy under Haile Selassie has always been directed, first of all, toward education, and secondly, toward modernization. Since his restoration in 1941, he put Canadian officials in the key ministries of finance and commerce. In education, more than 20% of Ethiopia's teachers are from Canada. People in uh, Ethiopia are then aware of Canada. Uh, Yes, Ethiopians know quite a bit about Canada. It is the first country we brought teachers from. There are still Canadian teachers in Ethiopia, and I hope we are going to get more Canadian teachers into Ethiopia in the near future. Mr. Robert Thompson of the Social Credit Party in Canada was uh, a teacher in Ethiopia. Mr. Thompson, you spent many years in Ethiopia. What was the occasion of your going there in the first place? Well, in 1943, following the defeat of the fascists in Ethiopia, there was no rehabilitation program available to that country, such as there was later for Italy, for Holland, for Denmark, for Norway. And consequently, anything that was done from the outside was done on a quasi or a, uh, an unof a quasi official or an unofficial basis. As a result, the Emperor Haile Selassie sent out a call to friends of his that he had known in Bath during the exile or prior to the takeover by the fascists, asking for volunteers, doctors, nurses, and teachers. At that time, I had two connections who were friends of the emperor. One was my padre in the RAF in Canada, Wing Commander Gregson. The other was Dr. R.V. Bingham in Toronto, who was head of the Sudan Interior Mission. When they heard or when they received word from the emperor in regard to the need for technical uh, help and rehabilitation services, they came to me and suggested to me. Uh, I led a team of nine doctors, nurses, and teachers uh, 
1943 to Ethiopia. In the first instance, I served in the first secondary school as vice principal, then went on into the Ethiopian Air Force for the duration, then back into secondary education and later on into administration where I served in a position which would be equivalent here to deputy minister. Well, you actually fought on the side of Ethiopia during the war. Well, no, not exactly in that way. We uh, were instrumental in setting up the tra first training academy of the Imperial Ethiopian Air Force, which was the start of the Air Force. In other words, the training program that we established there was similar to the Empire training scheme here in Canada, which we had been a part. You were responsible for the education of the Emperor's children. Well, I was responsible for the placing of uh, students in foreign universities, many of whom came to Canada. We also were responsible for setting up some of the schools in Ethiopia, and thus uh, a number of the royal family, as well as many hundreds of other Ethiopians, came into our hands, yes. How much of, uh, during your time in Ethiopia, got to know the emperor very well? Well, the emperor retained, up until just recently, the post of minister of education. He had a vice minister who actually carried on the day-to-day -day administration, but the emperor reserved the office for himself. And consequently, for at least six years, he was my direct boss, so to speak. I had a telephone line to his palace, uh, to his office as well, and we were in constant connection with him, not only in regard to developing education, but to many foreign assignments that I was sent on during these years. During my brief meeting with him, I found him to be a very human sort of person. This trip has been a real privilege for me because I have eaten my meals with him on the royal train, and I have spent at least three, four hours in consultation about world issues, about the Canadian scene, and about uh, the developing situation in Ethiopia. And so I could only agree with you entirely that he is truly one of the great statesmen of the world. I remember back in 1936 when he appeared before the League of Nations. I was quite young at that time, but I remember shedding more than one tear for the emperor. I, too, was very interested in that time, and I suppose when the opportunity came to go to Ethiopia that this was part of the background of it, because you will recall that the Japanese had invaded China at the same time. And I can recall as a high school student and then later as a young teacher my own concern about the Japanese invasion of China and the fascist invasion of Ethiopia. Despite the emperor's efforts to promote education and modernize the country, there were genuine grievances in Ethiopia. In December 1960, during the absence of the emperor in Brazil, a coup d'etat was attempted by senior officers of the Imperial Guard and a group of young administrators. Addis Ababa was seized, and the crown prince was proclaimed emperor. 